Femlink Pacific is a feminist organization and from the very start when we organized ourselves it was about the need to um, to counter the 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 underrepresentation of women in the media particularly broadcasting and I think in terms it was very clear for us one International Women's Day that um, an event we had organized, a women speak out, we were told that it wasn't commercially viable, um, was really that kind of like, right, we're going to make it about women, for women, by women, because we're just not in the media. I mean, the evidence is there in terms of the Global Media Monitoring Project. We could see that even though we had a high number of women working on, on radio, um, the content was not reflective of the kinds of issues that we felt was really important to be discussed, particularly in Fiji's context after the, the crisis of 2000. We've obviously expanded the community broadcasting as well from monthly broadcasts in 2005, 2006. We were starting to do broadcasts with the Lamy Town Council. We were doing the, the, the mobile broadcasting as well. So that was really significant. And then being in a position by 2011 to put in place Fiji's first rural community radio station led by rural young women who had benefited from our training, who had benefited from the Generation Next project. Um, and, and so that's really been, you know, that development. And then in 2015, we're now going 24 hours in in Suva, 89FM is now 24 hours. We've got a permanent mast. We've, you know, we've gone up to 300 watts. So that it's, there's been definitely been that growth, particularly for the 24-hour station in Suva. The fact and and to have the power, um, you know, the increase in transmission power means there's a wider reach. More people are able to hear it. There's a permanence of of this radio station now so we don't just have the frequency that we would use now and then we have that frequency it's locked in people can listen to a radio station about their communities about rural women's issues and um and that impact i mean it's like when somebody rang up and said that's just like my story so the fact that we're actually giving um a slice of life of of daily realities for women um, and there's a sense of permanence in terms of women-led media initiatives don't have to be small scale it doesn't just have to be at the micro level so we're actually demonstrating that when you invest in women's m media it's not just a one-off project but it can actually grow sustain and become a regional network as well whether they are a convener, correspondent or staff, the first step for any of the FemLink team is discovering their own voice, as it is these very people who have dedicated their lives to continuing to foster this growing women's-led media movement. All starting at different levels of experience, knowledge and passion, they are all dedicated in their own ways to champion equality and justice through communication. I discovered my voice through hearing uh, women's voice. When they raising up their issues, it's just like um, teenager pregnancy, unemployment, road conditions, and also drainage. Issues that I've been passionate about is about uh, unemployment. That, as we can see, that uh, most of the graduate students have been graduated from uh, university and also from FNU, but they didn't get a job, so they just stay in the village. When I, the first time when I reached home during our radio with pictures, I think last year from Lusuri at the Delcusa, Delcusa Church Hall, when I came home, my family member said, hey, you are on the TV. So, and I said, hey, you saw me? And they said, yes. Okay. So when they, when they replied to me, they said that I'm doing good. So 
the only thing that I have to do is my voice to raise it up. So I, and then I said to myself that I can do it. Next time I can. Through the Young Women's Project, Generation Next. Um, being a broadcaster when I started was uh, a way where I found I could voice my issues such as climate change, young women's empowerment, and that alone has empowered us, empowered me personally. So that's how I found my voice, like speaking on the radio all the time. I also had to do a lot of reading in terms of having to know what seed or Beijing. And so while reading and rehearsing, that was another way where you know if you say like your voice, radio voice. So that's how I. Well, bef like I'm the youngest in my family, so speaking when they have a family meeting or something is not supposed to happen. But ever since, like working with family, and we have any family gathering or anything like that, I'm able to to share, or like some of them didn't understand about people with disabilities, they would say, oh, that person's deaf, and I would correct them. No, that person has hearing impairment, so. And that's how, you know, I also make a change within my family. For me, it has meant a lot. Firstly, I was, I was a very shy person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to go up and speak to, it, even the rural women, I, w I couldn't do that. Because, well, tradition and culture, the younger generation have to listen to the older ones. So trying my, my best to just stand up there and speak to the older women was a challenge. But now it's, um, it's about giving them information and not about what was holding me back at them, just culture and stuff. I put that aside and because of the work that I'm doing with Family Inc., it's about trying to empower those rural women and show them that you can come up and speak. So for me, uh, being with Family Link has made me see things differently. It was a great challenge to me to be part of the Family Link Pacific Network because then what it means is because most of the time I was at home and now I'm able to come out of my shell, I would say, and have the freedom to participate in the community. The first time I heard myself on the radio, well, um, it was it was quite interesting because I've never like met, or I've never seen the radio before, or have never given the chance to speak, you know, on the radio. But I became the producer. I became the broadcaster of my story. So when I heard like me telling my story uh, when we were uh, told to produce our own story through the work or like the workshop that I joined in. And, and that's when I, I heard, you know, I mean, the, the, my voice, my, my radio voice. For me, I appreciated the fact that, uh, you know, for me it was not just about me hearing my voice there. It was about uh, enabling that space for women to share and speak about their concerns, their priority, uh, which they were facing at that time. And I remember uh, clearly one of the women that I recorded uh, very in those earlier days, uh, she said, uh, this was uh, Mrs. Dare, she said, you know, what, what we like about this uh, recording is that, you know, there's some sensitive issue. We cannot really see it in uh, people's faces. And we can say it here because it is safe space. It's just us. So it was uh, that voice enabling the environment for women and us to sit and talk. And uh, as we move along, when young women came in, for me, I find that um, maybe my role or my voice is more um, more for a different type of space, like in facilitation and and convening meeting. And 
I like to listen more to young women on radio. So this is about me finding my voice where I should be standing and where I should be projecting my participation. So I think that for me, my voice is not so much these are my issues and this is what I want because I'm a woman in the capital. I now have a job. Um, I you know, have had the opportunity to get educated and all that kind of stuff. So my voice is kind of meant to be the, the amplifier, the speaker, so not so much this is my story, but this is what women are saying. When I was working with Family Pacific, I live in the Lami area. And, uh, you know, I always broadcast and um, I always hear the issues that women from Nosori, women from Ba, women from Tavua, Lambasa, I hear their stories and I always wonder and I think, I'm, I'm living in Lami. Why can't I do something for the women of Lami? Why can't I produce something, their story, their personal experiences? Even though living in the informal sectors, their voice needs to be heard too. Yeah. I, I am a very shy person and I'm not a public speaker. But since I've been in a, involved with Family Pacific, going out in the community and doing radio broadcast, radio broadcast with the rural community, it has really boosted my confidence and, and knowing the issues and learning the issues about the women and talking about it had, has really helped me a lot. Quite interesting. It was the first time that I, I had my voice recorded and through the suitcase radio was in 2004 when I met the executive director for Family Pacific, Ms. Sharon Babon Rose. And after recording that and hearing my voice through the suitcase radio, it was quite encouraging. And uh, I think um, it was empowering as well. And it has also given me a chance to know that uh, I can do much more advocating for women, especially at that point in time. We were organizing a small uh, a group which were consisted of uh, single moms. So I knew that this was one space that we were able to advocate more for these uh, single moms in Nandi. I think uh, looking back at the early days with family, I started off as the Generation Next Team member, as you've mentioned. It has given me uh, empowerment through the work that I've been doing with Family. I started off uh, basically in doing community radio training. I was lucky enough that I was given the opportunity to at the first time operate the community suitcase radio that was uh, way back in 2006 and was fortunate to be offered a stiff bit of participation. I think that has uh, uh, given me the motivation to continue the work with community radio. And from there onwards, I was able to be posted to Tabua as a feminist convener. And my voice has been, I found has been powerful in terms with the women that I work with in rural communities that have also given them the safe space to come out and voice their issues directly with the use of community suitcase radio. Yes, of course, it really influenced my family life. I was brought up in a village setting. I got married and settled with two kids now. And someone that has really supported me in my work is my husband. Whenever I'm there to do any consultation or any, any work that is engaged with Family Pacific, he's so very supportive. He helps in setting up, setting up everything, the work that I'm doing with Family. He asks if he needs help, so he helps me. So I can see not only that I'm doing the work, my family are very supportive. Like men and women should be working together, that's what we want. And always my, help, uh, my husband that's within the family is very supportive in the work that I do. And he's really in, in interested, like hearing the stories of women, and he encourages me that you need to do this more. You need to work with the community. You need to empower women, because women, uh, their voices need to be heard. And it really, sometimes I think back, like in terms of family support, that he's there to support me all along, and he's continuing to do that so. Like for us, uh, just starting off a family, small family, sometimes it's really hard that we try to have that opportunity to come out, like to leave our homes and our children to come and participate. But through the work of the support of my husband and my family, I'm really, I'm really glad that they are supporting me through the work I'm doing with Family Inc. The women's leaders who Family Inc. Pacific connect with are often the people who don't make the news, let alone have the resources, including time, to access the print or broadcast media.
Our work is in information and communication exchange. Fana Lomani first gained her media production and broadcast experience as a member of the Generation Next project. Today, residing in Tavur, she convenes our network meetings, produces radio programs, and assists in outreach and networking with local government officials in Tavur and Rakiraki. Let me take it back that these rural women, they do not have access to information and communication. So when I talk about rural women, it, it means that rural women, they do not have access to, like, for, for example, based in Suva, you have access to, to some of the, the uh, nearby offices. You can hear the news. You can know what is happening within the community. But these rural women, to tell you that they are not really aware of what is happening around, uh, around them, around the community, around the nation, and around the world. They never hear news, they don't understand, but through getting them through family link network, sometimes when we have the network, I make sure that Fiji Times is there, or the Fiji Sun is there, at least they come in, they read something, they understand what is happening within the community. And uh, with family link Pacific work and leading up to election, we were giving them information on, uh, they've been, some of them have attended to training on how to vote, as most of them didn't understand how to do voting. So I guess that's something that we we'll have to look into in future. Uh, leading up to election, we had a pre-election like a consultation. We were interviewing them. Do they really understand whom they have to vote for? I guess this kind of thing they should be aware of as rural women. And family is doing a great work for them educating them, not only on their issues, not only on their community, but trying to take another step forward, like at the national level, that, that they need to be aware of what is going around them. And with Family in Pacific's work, I, I understand that they have really learned a lot in coming out and hearing information and taking them back to their community. Where I can, uh, where I uh, work with the women in the rural areas and also uh, enabling and encouraging the women in terms of sharing out uh, their stories and also talking more about the issues and the problems that they face in their daily life. Not only that, but also when the women are being recorded or interviewed, it is, they always say that uh, your organization is different from which types of his son. Why is that? And they say, because you, when you record our voice, after a while you have to come back to us and come and give us, like for the CRT, that is one good example recording their voice and getting the CRT, going back to them and give them, actually this is what I did with your voice. And they prefer like the NGO or Family Pacific rather than Fiji Times or Fiji Sun. And she said because Fiji Times Fiji Sun, whenever they in need, they come running to us for our story or anything. But after when they have received anything, everything that they have done to me or to take and bombard me my voice, they never come back to me and see whether this thing has been taken to where. As the Pacific coordinator of the WAC Global Media Monitoring Project, we also turn our attention to not just monitoring the news, but addressing the gaps in news media reports through a radio show titled, Who Makes the News? We're constantly talking about what the mainstream media is doing and what we can do to balance it out, particularly in terms of balancing the, the scales of gender. And so what we do is promote women and their experiences, women and their leadership, to constantly remind people that there is no excuse to not involve them. So that's what I feel that we do, and that's what we try and do every day. And I think every day is kind of an achievement because part of my work is doing a daily, um, writing a daily feature. So every day being able to put at least one story out a day means that you're putting close to maybe 300 stories out in a year, and those are 300 women that otherwise wouldn't be in the media space. The way women communicated in 2000, following the civilian coup, and during the Blue Ribbon Peace Visual Campaign, differed greatly from the experiences following the 1987 military coup. In 2000, some of us had access to mobile phone technology and the internet. Since then, it has been increasingly clear that the onset of new medias and ICTs has molded the way we communicate. With, with the challenges, like for now, um, the instability of the country, and when it comes to freedom of expression, uh, that's one of the challenges young women and women are facing and they, uh, they, have the f they have like fear in them of talking. 
and just uh, talking about the issues that, that that's happening uh, that they are facing so i guess that is one of the challenge and also when it comes to development community development uh, infrastructure development uh, and development in all areas i think that the transformation i mean of the the people in power uh, for the decision makers you know we have somebody who is managing this and then this one is resigned or terminated and then another one comes in and does not you know keep track of the thing that is planned already and i think that is one of the biggest challenge like fiji is facing because of the different you know decision people coming in to the decision making process and not keeping uh, you know not sustaining that you know in the plans and yeah and i guess that's one of the challenge yes uh, mainly last year when we had the elections and then we had to like when there's something that happens in the government and we try and get the people to share their views on what they think about it they would no i I don't want to. I wouldn't want to speak because they're scared that something might, you know, happen to them. The government might come after them or something like that. Even though we tell them it's okay to speak, we will filter what you, you know, if there's something wrong, we'll, they still wouldn't want to. So, so yeah, so it's in those kind of situations. While Fiji ratified CEDAW in 1995, gender equality and women's human rights standards have not permeated into the local and national governance structures, something that continued to be one of the contributing factors to why women are not making the news. As we know in the community, especially in the, in the Itaoku community, also in the settlement as well, getting to get right to them is quite a challenge. You know, you have to go through so many processes, you have to consider the Romani Koro, or in the settlement, you have to see, you know, the family, the family. If you can go in and talk to the women and try to try to do your work, it's very hard. There is a barrier there, and that barrier still exists. And uh, you know, thankful to Family Pacific, sometimes we, out of empowering, we are able to, you know, just try to find a way to go through that. But yeah, that's a challenge, and it's still existing, and it and it will go on with other communities as well. By going to the field, the only thing that stops women from speaking is uh, because uh, for us, uh, like the Itaki people, like we have our traditional culture. Because I can still remember in some of the communities, like uh, the women are not given chances to speak in terms of meeting and stuff. But uh, in another case, if we just go to the women and be with the women, then they can speak out a word slowly, but in the Itauki language. But if we keep on visiting them by month or by fortnight, then they'll change. Obviously, they will change. I'll give an example with one lady that I've seen that's, that has changed, Kalawati. She would never want to speak. And even though if we told her, no, you can speak your vernacular or Hindi, she would say, oh, it's okay. But now, she's, my name is Kalawati. She's managed to say her name. She's managed to, you know, to say what her group is doing. So it changes, like, it shows that she is empowered enough to speak. She even speaks to the Itauke women, whom she didn't do before. So, yeah. Well, I would say currently we are having the 1325 monthly consolidation, which helps a lot. The women have developed uh, themselves. They have become very confident to talk and to relate their matters, and they are opening up. And uh, I have seen the silence of culture has broken. They, they integrate very well with other, and this, uh, when the members come, they come from different uh, uh, groups, and that multiculturalism also gets. And uh, I, I, I think a bigger, uh, uh, we can extend more from last uh, so many years, it has been extending. Eh? This expansion has helped the women of all um, cultures to meet and to enter, you know, relate their affairs and then 
also we have seen through these uh, messages which we even gave on the other groups they are interested they talk about family and how can we be involved so rest not restrictions are there but uh, looking at the other uh, background then we are able to communicate with uh, monthly consultation for TNB man if this uh, consultation uh, goes beyond that so other women can also get involved we have good structures in place to make sure that we're not just protecting ourselves as a media organization but also protecting the women who do not necessarily take a risk but go out of their way and have had to come out of their shell to share their story to, in an attempt to create change and improve um, their living situation so those are some of the challenges as a feminist media organization, Feminine Pacific has deliberately used our community media process to develop, produce, and distribute our media and policy initiatives with women leaders. This has resulted in the convening of what is referred to as our monthly 1325 network meetings, now hosted in Tavua, Ba, Nandi, Nasori, Lambasa, and slowly extending into other communities due to a growing demand from women to have regular network meetings. I can say to an extent where it's, it has brought a whole lot of people together since 2006 and now. The numbers have changed over time. It has always increased. Uh, people wanting to know more, like an example in Lambasa, it has, Family Inc. there has brought us to, to reach Rambi now. You know, they've, like, uh, we are heard at a broader at a broader network now so it's very important people coming in shows that the work that we are doing has a meaning to them so that's why it's it's really important what we're doing getting the media for people to come and voice their their issues and their opinions I think it continues to provide a safe space for women to get access to information. Mainstream media is very important to us in Suva, but it is more or less inaccessible to those who don't have money to buy the paper, who don't have electricity to um, access the news. And so the more that we can provide these spaces so that women feel like they have a connection to decision makers and then they can hold those decision makers accountable, the, the more that they can continue to engage at the local level to improve their communities. One of the experience that I had, and that's where I built uh, my passion from, is uh, know that then I realized that I have this in a voice. <laughs> was when I went to, out to Lombasa. That's the first time for me to go out to Lombasa. And then we went out to Vunimoli, like how many kilometers away from Lambasa town, just traveling on the road, meeting the women, listening to them, that just broke my heart. And I could remember, like, and you know, the, the, the amazing part of it was I was a young women and the group was full of um, it's a multiracial group uh, but then at that time there were only uh, Indo Fijian women and I, I, I mixed well with the group we were talking they were like they were like in the 70s and 80s. And even though they were speaking to me in Hindi, I don't know Hindi. I could see the expression, you know, in their eyes, the way they talk. They are telling me their story. And that just grabbed everything. And from there, I just realized the work 
that I'm doing, or Family Pacific is doing, is very powerful. Yeah. Well, for the broader community, it is really, really good because for us, because when we share our stories with the women, in terms of when, for them, the women, they don't, whatever they have learned from family, it doesn't stay within them. They used to share out all the information that they have learned. So when it comes to another meeting, we can see some new faces are there. Then whenever we have our program, we start with a program, then we used to start with our cycle process. In that time where women are given a space for them to speak whatever they want to. And also some of the women, touchingly, when they share their story, they say, um, I have never heard anything about family. But with my friend here, when she, whenever she come over and share to me about actually the work that uh, Family Pacific does, this is where I am today. I really want to come and join in. So in that sense, I think 1325 is more important. For example, like Family in the North help the women in writing up their letters and also help the women in to, for them to be recognized. But not only my women, I also would like to talk about the LGBT, LGBTIQ community, the House of Colors. They were already formed, but they were searching for a place where they could be recognized. When uh, the first uh, Idaho program that we hosted for Family Link in the Northern this year, then from there after that Idaho, the House of Colors, the LGBTIQ community, they were being recovered. They, they were being recognized by the community, by the people in Lombasa. There are those who are tuning into FemTalk, um, they don't really know the issues, you know, about LBT. I'm speaking specifically on LBT. Um, because they don't know what they faced when they were young, so by sharing it um, on air would, would actually change the mindset of people instead of judging them, you know. They have the story behind That's why I call my show The Other Side of the Room. Because there's always a story behind them, behind the LGBT community. So by sharing those kind of stories to um, on air, to share it on air, it would actually change the mindset of those who are listening. When you have been silenced by systems or made invisible due to the lack of representation, whether in the media or in community events, where women and girls are often relegated to the catering roles, it takes a while to discover and claim your voice, to speak purposefully, to communicate the changes that are needed and to challenge the status quo. First of all, I'm being empowered and it's quite a privilege to be able to speak out and... Uh, raise an issue which is very important and hopefully to make a change in the community. We have to advocate for those issues. We have to advocate for the issues and make sure that the voices of these women are heard through the community radio. The fact that those stories that we first produced as our fembids, um, as um, whether it was keeping watch, postcards for peace, the interviews with market vendors in Not Just Sweet Talk, that those issues, there's a continuum. It, those issues are still relevant today. We're, we can say that back in 2001, a market vendor was telling us that as a result of the 2000 crisis, she was having to sell her bindi and bean for 50 cents. Um, and you can go back now and see the struggle of market vendors. The aspirations for peace in terms of postcards for peace in 2003, um, we made those linkages with the tourism sector, the impact of conflicts there. And this year's documentary is also called Postcards for Peace. It's, but this time there's a regional perspective in terms of Pacific postcards, Pacific communication. So it's a continuum. It's not like okay, we've dealt with it, now let's move on. There's peace building takes a long, it's ongoing work, and we still haven't resolved the issues that brought us together in 2000. So it's, it's ongoing work. And I think every day is kind of an achievement because part of my work is doing a daily, um, writing a daily feature, so every day being able to put at least one story out a day means that you're putting close to maybe 300 stories out in a year and those are 300 women that otherwise wouldn't be in the media space. We are giving the women 
the opportunity uh, just to talk about the issues. And also at the same time, we are asking them to give in their recommendation. And with this, like we, with the women's issues, with community radio, uh, it will be, it will assist like the changes that happen, or it will contribute to the change eh, that happen in, uh, in the policy level and also to the decision makers. Eh? So I think that is one of the, the greatest thing, I mean, that a family Pacific is doing and also recognizing you know the women as their as the agents of change in their different communities and empowering them uh, to utilize their leadership skills for me i feel that the value in there is that uh, it's not only them uh, hearing their voices but it's more so in how that is impacting their participation in them uh, speaking out. They, uh, the value in it that I've, I've seen in my experience and I, I've actually seen it working across, you know, over the years, is uh, it builds a certain level of confidence in these women. You know, oh, I can speak, really, I can engage there, I can wow, it's me talking there and saying this. And uh, I see the changes in these women. Um, I see women started speaking in their vernacular at first, and they hear themselves on radio. And the next time around, when we come to speak with them, they are speaking in English. So that was one step forward in their, uh, building their confidence. Well, in a sense, because uh, through sharing, the women in the community where I come from, they have started to develop in terms of sharing their issues. They have stood up to fight for their own right. And also they're trying to be recognized everywhere. And also forming communities, forming groups, clubs. And also they, are, they have projects. That is one social change that I've seen within the women. Not only that, even for them, before they hardly go, before they hardly speak to the ministers or to any of the government officials, but by coming to the consultation from the Pacific, they can just go to any of the government department and speak to them. After, after being part of that, they, they get involved with other, with other functions as well in the community and they start to share with other friends as well, especially in the home, sharing with the husbands and the children and the daughters. And it has also helped the family. Is broader, broaden the the how they see women and to participate, and even the husbands, especially coming from the patriotic society, the, the men coming to understand women more that they can do much better than just staying in the home. My family, they started understanding what family is because uh, before there was uh, not any knowledge about family. So now, uh, I mean, associating myself with the uh, family, they have seen the difference and they see the strategies the family is using, which is quite beneficial to all. And the other part I have noticed, uh, there is uh, a young girl in my family currently in high school. She attended one of the young women's uh, this uh, uh, consultation program in Nandi, and she was very much excited. And uh, she is so much interested with family, uh, and uh, like uh, in the holidays, she uh, she was asking me before any more uh, workshop in the holidays so that I can join in. So this shows this inspiration we getting the younger women are getting the inspiration from families. From the local level networks to national and international fora, it is clear that our process of community media consultations reveals the evidence that women are leading in their communities and young women have the potential to lead. When they come, they're not representing themselves. It's not about them or their family. It's about the community at, la at large. So when they come to sharing their issues, as I've uh, highlighted in the two days, uh, past two days, that there was a, a lady from Batukula Back Road, which is about uh, 20 kilometers from Tabua. She has been part of our network since family started in 2012, and she has been highlighting the issue with electricity. 
So for three years, she's trying to get the electric supply in her home. We had a program with Family Pacific and we invited the local government to be presented as our speakers. So she was able to highlight this issue directly to the district officer, which happens to be a lady. So through that engagement, through that uh, connection of sharing information, she was able to have the electricity uh, restored within two weeks. So I guess for me that's uh, something that's happened, development has happened, not only within her family, but within the community as a whole. I think family has been doing a great work for them, not only documenting their stories, but development and uh, changes have been happening for the community. For example, in the nursery we have nine set. The only issues that, ha that she has been raising is uh, um, that uh, in their village meeting, only men are allowed to talk. But when she comes into our 1325 meetings, we have been empowered them that women have the right to, to raise up their voices too. So when she goes back into the community, and the next, the next uh, meeting we have, our 1325, she raised up that she is one of the women who will be participate in their village meeting. Uh, yes, during our 1325 monthly meeting, uh, we have uh, they have been raising their issues. Like for this month, they have been raising this. For the next month, they will see what they have been, uh, what the changes they have been uh, see. For example, in uh, Nursery Village, like uh, Nancy have always uh, raised up is their drainage that uh, beside their village is the Uluiduko Creek, but uh, last uh, last consultation with our International Peace Day, she mentioned that the town council have been uh, cleared all the rubbish that in the drain so that they can make it wider and it's the drain start to flow well into the river. Also in the Yalilevu community, when uh, Catherine Tilakoro, she interviewed in radio and TV about the issues with the local town council, how they are treating our women. It's just a small issue, but when they come to collect early in the morning, when they come and collect uh, garbage and all that, and since elderly people are living there, and also disabled people, they are being uh, actually... They are just being ill-treated by this. Day. So while she had a talk uh, on the TV, I think the officials they took, took note of it, and now things are slowly improving. Following our initial production of a series of documentaries, Feminine Pacific has focused our attention on the development of our Fem Talk 89FM radio network. However, the opportunity to be innovative and link television to our mobile radio broadcast in 2012 saw the introduction of the Radio with Pictures series. It was time to make women visible, as well as continue to amplify their voices in the lead-up to the 2014 general elections to ensure that women could be seen and heard. Because, you know, from just hearing their voices in the radio, they're able to see themselves and, uh, and, uh, and they're able to... Um, as for me, what I've seen is that uh, from my experience, most of the time I get to be scared to see myself again on the television, you know. Um, but I'm very surprised that uh, people, people that I, I didn't think that they would see, you know, they just come back and just told me, people in the community, you know, they, they, they just say, oh, you, you women are so good, you know, we watch on the TV, they keep telling me because most of the time, truly, I'm scared of seeing myself. But it, it's the response from the other people in the society. They get to see it and they get to appreciate it. And even now, when I go to Lotoko Nandi, you know, everything that I do, hey, family, man, family, you know, they keep saying that. And I think that's one of the advantage. You just broaden the visibility of these women as well. Well, it feel good. Because sometimes you, only, you don't only want your voice to be heard on... Uh, on radio, he also want to be viewed. So in that sense, maybe people are be asking, who's this, who's this person talking? But one day, if your voice had been heard on simulcast or any TV shows, they said, wow, that was, one, that was the lady who was talking about this issue. Even it will, it will bring, uh, it will realize how important our voice is to the country where we live in today, like Fiji. Actually, being seen is uh, you are seeing the person in reality sharing the stories, then just from hearing themselves on the radio, so you can just hear the voice, but you do not really know who who she, she is or who he is. But on on uh, television, like uh, 
for me, for an example, if I'm watching a lady talking from Nandi or from Lutoka, so when we watch that person, when we see them personally on television, we can also figure out that the woman is talking about the real story, the real life she's facing in the community, and we're trying to, to get the location of the women, the community she, she's representing, and also we can tell or we can know that the story comes real when we see them on television as live. One significant moment was our first simulcast, where I was the radio host. That was uh, because it was the first ever in Lombasa to have radio with pictures. And I will never forget that because um, people were talking about that that time. They kept. Even till now, they would say, you know what, when are you going to have that same thing that you had in 2012? Some of my friends would ask me that because they saw me on television, so that was a significant moment for me. But I haven't actually seen the finished product of the Central Division consultation, but yeah. But it'll be interesting, it'll be really cool to see it. Um, and just listening to the women talk about their their experiences and their issues, again, has reaffirmed the fact that they are, you know, as I said, authorities of the issues that they're talking about and that they should be given more visibility, um, not just on community broadcasting, but even mainstream media as well. It's another way where, you know, people that you don't know actually just come up and talk to you. That's one thing. Another thing is uh, our families. They are so proud, like, knowing that this person's on television and they would switch on and tell the neighbours and yeah, it has meant a lot that way. I think it's really exciting because people are more nervous about being seen than they are being heard because they know that the, that visual medium has a bigger impact because you can't ignore someone if you can both hear and see them. So that makes people nervous and that's why I try and engage with the medium as often as I can to make it more accessible to as many people as possible. Well, doing community, as I said, doing community podcasts, it uh, we feel our rural women feel that they are uh, they are feeling they feel wanted and they feel inclusive that there is someone to listen to their voice, and usually. The rural women are left out and they're not very comfortable coming out of their comfort zone and talking, but when we take the radio broadcast to them, they really come out and with their issues and share their issues and what changes they want in the community. I was the president of Ba Women's Multiracial Club and one evening, I mean sorry, one afternoon, uh, Sharon Roll came down to our community and uh, I had been uh, called to come and interview. And um, I thank the Lord. It encouraged me that uh, Sharon came down and interviewed myself and uh, want uh, issues, what issues, issues I want to bring up that we are facing that time, the Bandra Women's Club, as the community settlement where I live in. And uh, that time I brought up that uh, that time Bandra was... Uh, was I uh, haven't got uh, the issues I brought up. That's a uh, bad road and uh, no electricity and um, no street lines and uh, around about 40 houses there. And uh, I'm very thankful from that time Sharon Hall came. I brought up the issues and I was ongoing uh, connection uh, with, um, with the women's and to the Turangani Koro and the local government, they come down and they talk with us. And that's from 2005 to 2015. If uh, Sharon, Roll, Sharon Roll going down to Bandra now, she gonna have the big change. We have a Tassil Road, a street lights there, and the water problem, no more problem. Time the time I'm talking now. Um, example. She has been speaking on having electricity at Nasoni settlement, which is 25 kilometers just out of Lombasa town. And 
her being empowered, her getting information from Family Pacific has shown her which places to go, like where to go and speak, at which level. It also empowered her not to, you know, just stay home and wait for something to happen. So when her attending 1325 meetings, um, us going to visit them has empowered her that way in making her going out to these places here and fighting for for what they really need then in uh, the Sony settlement. When, when their voices are heard, um, there have been um, uh, installments or erections of street lights and that is the whole Lummi area and footpaths and their voice, um, their voice have been heard too because of the water problem. One area in Lummi, not only one area but Lummi area, um, of a woman from um, Lummi village. She had come into a consultation and she had raised her voice about water and there were local government president. So the next week was like, she came back and she, she, she said that there was water going. So yes, it's a success when talking with Family Pacific. I think to just get that recognition or understanding from the people that women actually know what they're talking about, um, whatever issue that they're talking about, that they are legitimate authorities um, to speak about the issues that are important to them and that are affecting them. Well, I felt, because the story that I was telling that day was not only for me, I felt that the voice will be influencing, like uh, like empowering other young people who, who will be listening out there, also will be influencing, like influencing the policy makers, you know, hearing the stories of a young woman, like brought up in Suva, and, you know, with got everything, but it's just financial problems to, you know, um, to back up my education, yeah, so. Challenging the structures from the local all the way up to even the global, because I think in the global spaces, we're challenging the decisions that are made without actually seeing ourselves as Pacific women in those spaces. So what's relevant to us. So if you're talking about peace and security, who's peace and security? Is it really about peace and security only in the context of African or Asian or Middle East conflicts? Or is it also about our peace and security in terms of environmental security, in terms of the reduction of rural poverty, the feminization of poverty, access to health? So it's claiming spaces at every level and if you don't have a voice you can't claim that space. So I think using the com community media model we have actually been filling those gaps for a lot of the commercial media and I think the more that we're able to demonstrate how important it is to have media for by and about the people the more that people are able to develop as well as develop their own communities. And so now that we're back in parliamentary democracy, the only thing left to do is empower people so that they are able to operate, one, within a democratic system, but also how do we use the systems that exist and transform the systems that exist to be a proper kind of democracy, or actually to be a functioning and well-developed country, let alone the name of democracy or otherwise, because people are just living in situations that aren't fair in 2015, you know, giving birth to kids by a river, or having to stop bleeding with hair as a community nurse. Those are realities that we hear, but that's not okay in 2015. So the more we're able to communicate this and articulate this, the more that people are able to do that on their own, the, the more that you're able to raise the issues and then address them go back and forth. It's, it's the two-way communication and without the communication channels you can't have the change. In Suva, like the government is here, everything is here. So voicing our issues in Lombasa is very important for us. We get to have others hear us at all levels. Um, even the rural women, they are given that opportunity to come and when they hear us it empowers them, it empowers us also. My role as the convener, more and more I see it as um, 
as a position of uh, opportunity whereby change can happen positively, I hope, in <laughs> enabling the, the environment uh, for peace, stability, and uh, sustainable development. So as we started in the beginning with uh, this work and passion working in peace building, and uh, peace building is such a broad uh, banner. So in uh, Family Pacific, we focus, we based on community media, which is an important tool of peace building. And in uh, Trans and Oceania, in our work with peace building, we are more focused on the ground, working in community, and them analyzing what's their conflict. You know, we have this every day. You know, we don't see um, um, uh, conflict whereby violence is visible. But we do have conflict. There is uh, the day-to-day um, -day living, for example, the cost of living. Uh, children, babies cannot drink milk because it's too expensive. We can't afford it. Or um,
So it's actually a bilingual station. English is our lingua franca, so we are going to have continuity in, in English. A lot of the programs are in English, but it is about using a language that all ethnic groups can understand. It's about sharing space of um, with the diversities of women. So we started with look at my abilities to promote women's disability rights, and now we have you know the LGBT programs with House of Chameleon, with Diva for Equality. We've got a very strong focus on rural women and bringing rural women on the air and young women as producers. So it's really about addressing those gender imbalances, um, the inequities, but through the voice and through the content that's produced by women.